Please welcome Vice President, Technology and Customer Solutions, AWS, Francesca Vasquez. Welcome everyone, welcome to reInvent 2022. I can't hear you all. Welcome to reInvent 2022. My name is Francesca Vasquez and I have the honor and privilege to lead AWS's Solutions Architecture and Customer Solutions Organization. I also have the opportunity to lead our AWS Resilience Customer and Partner Program. And I am so excited to have you here today. On behalf of the AWS Architecture Organization and our broader community, we'd like to dedicate this session on building modern applications through the lens of observability and resilience to David Grimm. He was a solutions architect, a technologist, and an amazing thought leader that we lost here recently. So, about a year ago, on December 25th, we witnessed one of the largest innovations in human history go production. Over 29,000 engineers and scientists worked on this product and this project with, that would impact the entire human race. And this innovation was arguably one of the largest resilience and observability initiatives ever taken. What I'm referring to is the James Webb Telescope, which you heard referenced earlier in Adam's keynote. It is the largest, most powerful telescope ever built. It will allow scientists to look at what our universe was like about 200 million years after the Big Bang. Just incredible innovation. The James Webb Telescope has been under development for over 20 years. $10 billion budget for the program, which was up from the original $1 billion forecasted in 2002. And as the team was doing their own resilience testing, they found that during a vibration test that the screws holding the actual sun shield together failed and they also popped loose. This led to another 10 months and an additional $800 million in costs. This testing was done to simulate the actual testing of riding an Ariane 5 rocket to space. This telescope had to actually travel a million miles and then open up remotely. And did I mention, there's only one of these. NASA actually had to build the necessary observability and resilience capabilities into one device. They had to build this system to be able to withstand the micrometeor strikes and temperature swings that ranged anywhere from 230 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 394 degrees Fahrenheit. And it took about a month to get to its final location, which is about a million miles from Earth. And when I tell you this, this space telescope, it's really big. It represents about a three-story building. Its width and length is equal to that of a tennis court. And to actually get this thing to launch, you actually fold it up before the rocket can go off. And finally, the team at NASA and our European Space Agency, they had to create the tools to test and overcome more than 300 single points of failure. They had to create the necessary observability tooling to actually make this possible. And the photo that you happen to see up here is of the Tarantula Nebula, which is 161,000 light years away. Today, we have an action-packed agenda. We'll be on a very deep exploration on how we think about resilience and observability with the same mission-critical application lens as a NASA space telescope. We're also going to hear from two amazing customers 
who will be sharing their best practices on how to build and design modern applications with resiliency in mind. Finally, we're gonna close off the day today with strategies and resources to help you all think about continuous improvement. Now, before we begin, I wanna level set everyone on some important definitions just so we're on the same mental model. First off, how we think about observability, it really describes how well you can understand what is happening with your system, often by instrumenting it to collect metrics, logs, and traces. Resilience, the ability of a workload to recover from infrastructure, service, or application disruptions. Both observability and resilience are a critical and foundational element to AWS's well-architected framework. They specifically live in the reliability and operational excellence pillars. So two of the six pillars of an architectural framework that we use. Similar to NASA's approach with the Webb Telescope, at AWS, we wanna partner with all of you to help you automatically be able to recover from failures, to build and test recovery procedures to help you scale, and to help implement changes being ongoing automation so that we can reduce manual errors. So to cover off on our building applications and resiliency, please give a warm welcome to my colleague, Shon Nandi, who is the Director of Solutions Architecture and Customer Success for our strategic customers. Thank you so much. Welcome to reInvent. Thank you, Francesco. What an incredible story to hear about the telescope. It is great to be here with all of you today. I see customers, I see friends in the audience. Thank you for taking time, especially with all the exciting World Cup action. I hope there's some football, American soccer fans in the audience. Maybe, yes? <laughs> uh, for those tuning in via the stream, please thank you for joining us virtually. In business, the resilience of workloads is critical. Today we're gonna to hear from two customers from FINRA and Capital One, and we'll walk through how we work with all our customers to ensure their workloads are well-architected and resilient on AWS. So let's dive right in. What is resilience? Resilience refers to the ability for workloads, workloads are your applications, your products, your business processes, to respond and quickly recover from failure. A workload can be simple as a, sing a single application running in a single AWS account, or it might be a set of products that span multiple accounts. There are three mental models I want you to consider as we go through today's presentation. Think about how you can build systems to be highly available with resistance to common failure modes. How to recover your system if you run into one of these rare failure scenarios. And underpinning all of this is the idea of continuous resilience. This is where you're implementing DevOps practices like CI CD to automate your, de your delivery pipelines. Introducing failure on an ongoing basis to test your system chain and test your teams for weaknesses and implementing ongoing observability and monitoring practices. As with security and sustainability, resilience is a shared responsibility. AWS is responsible for resilience of the cloud. You, our customers, are responsible for resilience of your workloads in the cloud. This shared model helps relieve your operational burdens, the customer's operational burdens, as AWS operates, manages, controls the host operating system, the virtualization layer, all of the infrastructure. We're responsible for all the services that are offered in the AWS cloud. Customer responsibility is determined by the services you select. You, gotta, you have to carefully consider which services you choose as the responsibilities will vary depending on how they integrate, what regulatory frameworks apply. And Often, you'll hear us recommending using our higher level services. You heard about the serverless announcements this morning in Adam's keynote. Those tend to have less operational responsibilities that sit with you. As a solution architecture leader, my teams partner with all of you to make these decisions. You're not alone in figuring this out. AWS, from day one, has built resilience into our culture. We use a service ownership model internally, which incentivizes our teams to continuously improve their operations. We've organized our engineering and product management efforts into small, multidisciplinary teams. We call them two pizza teams. Most of you have heard this term. 
We like it because we think those teams can be fed by two pizzas. Depends, I guess, on the size of the pizzas. And these teams own a service end to end. What that means is the ownership is not just of designing and launching their service, but you have to operate it during production, be on calls for issues as they arise. For customers who use this structure, it's a major cultural shift. The idea that your responsibility for the service never really ends. In AWS, all new services are reviewed for launch using an operation readiness process we call ORR. It's basically a set of questions, a checklist that uses known best practices and a standardized runbook. When we roll out new services or update existing ones, we use safe, continuous deployment pipelines that automate pre-production testing, support automatic rollbacks, and stagger deployments. When we launch our services or even add features, we start small. We start with a single instance, go across an AZ, roll out across multiple AZs, finish a region, and then ultimately roll to our other regions. And if any issues arise, we leverage our correction of error process. This is where we go and understand what the root cause was. This is not about placing blame. This is about diving deep to find the true reason that something failed. And after an issue is mitigated, we drive company-wide engineering sprints to ensure the issue is fixed across all AWS services. The learnings become part of the ORR process, goes right back to the top, and ensures similar issues don't reoccur. When we think about resilience in the cloud, there are four key areas we focus on. First, you have to anticipate what's gonna happen. To do this, we use code reviews, failure-oriented programming, immutability, simple designs whenever possible. Second, monitoring. We're gonna talk a lot more about this. Health checks, tracing, alarms, dashboarding. Responding. This can be the longest part of any incident, and you minimize that by identifying event-driven patterns using machine learning-powered operations. And finally, learning. I talked about the COE process that we've built. We look at our logs, and all that learning is fed right back in to anticipate better the next time, and we come full circle. When we think about your responsibility for resilience in the cloud, you also need to think about resilience threat modeling. There are typical categories of failure, you see them up on the screen. For example, for code deployments, what happens when you have a failed deployment? How, what are you set up to have occur? Do you have instrumentation to detect it? Can your CI CD system automatically roll back? In core infrastructure, what if a single instance is terminated? Have you designed to make sure this will not impact you? And if there's an impairment in a single AZ or you experience a gray failure, what's gonna happen? In terms of data and state, what if your customers overwhelm your service or your database gets corrupted? What happens if a third party dependency fails? Do you gracefully degrade? I talked to a CIO this morning about a challenge they faced a couple weeks ago, a major application outage. They had a dependent system, it was uh, a login system, federation system that failed, a queue built up, 1.2 million requests out there, and it took them seven hours to respond and detect. They didn't have an automatic rollback in place. And they knew, they knew, they knew that it was a challenge after the fact they hadn't prioritized fixing it, and they wanna fix it. You have to consider these. Now, you also have to think about unlikely scenarios. You may choose not to engineer for the really unlikely ones, but you should consider what'll happen. What if a natural disaster impacts an entire coast in the United States? Or my favorite panic scenario, what are you gonna do during the zombie apocalypse? How will you keep your systems up? I keep a bag packed, just in case. Um, a key part of resilience workloads is making sure you have a strong foundation. Start with AWS infrastructure. With the launch of Hyderabad last week, we have 30 AWS regions, and each region has at least three availability zones. And each AZ is a multiple, physically separated data center. Each region has two independent, fully redundant transit centers. On top of that is your network. Your network should always be redundant, always available, and seamlessly routed. On top of that, you've got your data. You have to have confidence in the resilience of your data. There's so many forms, file system, block, databases, in-memory caches. Consider how eventual consistency impacts design. And finally, your application. You highly resistant applications should be able to self-heal. We like you to use microservices app architecture when you're building new. We know many existing apps don't do that. You wanna decouple interdependencies, have loose coupling when possible, and always remove state when you can from app components. Your goal is to build systems that never fail. The reality is failures do happen. 
So there are a few things you can do to help reduce the impact of failure. First, very basic, set timeouts. Do you know that many frameworks default to infinite timeouts? That is just asking for trouble. You need retry with back off. When you don't back off, you're gonna end up with a retry storm, a subsequent cascading failure. One retry is usually resilient enough, enough to be resilient to intermittent errors. Retry once, fail fast. That example I mentioned, mentioned earlier, 1.2 million up in the queue, yeah, clearing that was a pretty big pain. You wanna limit the sizes of your queues. And make sure you rate limit your APIs and load shed when needed. Before failures occur, it's important to test. Continuous testing is imperative in understanding how your system will react to unknowns. This includes strategies like chaos engineering, conducting game days, practicing failovers. We use chaos to prove or disprove our assumptions about our system's capability to handle disruptive events. Chaos stresses an application in testing or production environments. We create disruptive events artificially, server outages, API throttling. Amazon has been purposely injecting control failure into, our, into limited environments since the early 2000s. That's how we ensure readiness for the most adverse of circumstances. AWS is investing heavily in resilient services. We just spoke about chaos engineering. I wanna call out the AWS Fault Injection Simulator, a fully managed service, we love those, that simulates real world failure to uncover hidden bugs, monitoring blind spots and performance bottlenecks. Our resilience hub, uh, AWS Resilience Hub, provides a central place to define, validate, and track the resilience of your applications on AWS, and it pulls in the best practices from our well-architected framework so you can benefit from what all your other customers have learned and done. And lastly, I'd like to highlight the Amazon Route 53 Application Recovery Controller. It enables you to control your application recovery across multiple AWS regions, availability zones, and on-prem. It makes recovery simpler and more reliable by eliminating the manual steps required by traditional tools and processes. And I'm excited today to announce a new enhancement to the Route 53 Application Recovery Controller. We're adding a new feature in preview today called Zonal Shift. It's built on Elastic Load Balancer, inclusive of ALBs and NLBs. During a failure, removing your application in an AZ can be complex. It can include configuration steps across EC2, ELB, auto-scaling. Customers like yourself have been asking us for a simple, reliable, and easy-to-use tool that can help recover from AZ impairments. With Zonal Shift, when you build your applications with ELB and have cross-zone traffic disabled, you get a built-in control for shifting application traffic away from an AZ with a single action. To learn more about this preview, there's a session tomorrow, ARC 329 at 10.45 a.m. Pacific, breakout session, please go check it out. It's a pretty cool feature. Now, I'm excited to introduce our first customer, Will Meyer, Managing VP of Cloud and Connectivity for Capital One. Please join me in welcoming Will to the stage. Thank you, Sean, and good afternoon, everybody. It is awesome to see uh, all of you. You know, I spend a fair bit of time thinking about what are the differences between just being on the cloud and really thriving on the cloud. And I think true system resilience is one of those things, so it's great to be able to talk about it with you. If you're not familiar with Capital One, we are a financial services institution, basically an information business. Our success is based on our ability to process data, generate insight that we can use to help our customers financially, for example, by giving them credit. And so when you think about it, being resilient to external change and managing risk are baked into our business model, not just our tech stacks. We've been doing it for a while since before the public cloud was a thing, but I think we knew pretty early that it would be an accelerator for us. There were Capital One folks on stage at reInvent in 2015 talking about our intention to go all in on AWS, we did that. We rebuilt and migrated thousands of workloads, petabytes of data. We built a security and controls framework that was appropriate to the level of trust that our customers place in us and also what our regulators demand. And in 2020, we closed our last data center. We have hundreds of teams that are doing everything from online user experience to advanced machine learning, call center, back office, all on AWS. It has been challenging, but it's also been super fun, and AWS has been a tremendous enabler for our teams and for our business. We also have some battle scars, 
And I think we have learned along the way that we're making a lot of good progress on sane defaults, but the cloud isn't perfectly plug and play quite yet. There is complexity. Uh, there are trade-offs everywhere. I think we see that when we talk about cost. I know many of us are focused on reducing waste in our cloud spend. I think we see in security and compliance, we want the right thing to be the easy thing, but we're still working on easy. And so as we talk about observability and resilience in general, I think it's important to not just look at them as a set of isolated patterns, but really as an integrated part of your overall approach to managing the cloud. You know, you all work with the cloud every day. I think it's easy to forget just how far the conversation about cloud resilience has really come. You know, I remember being asked, hey, what happens when Amazon has a big holiday e-commerce spike and all of a sudden there's no more spare capacity to run AWS? And, you know, it never really worked that way, but I think it's a good reminder of just how much has changed. AWS is serving incredibly demanding sectors. We see really world-class engineering talent working on resilience of public, public cloud infrastructure, including through open source. At Capital One, we have had tremendous outcomes. We have fewer customer impacting incidents. We are faster to recover when we do have them. We attribute that largely to the partnership with AWS. It has been really powerful, and I know many of you have seen the same. You also all know, I think, that the cloud isn't actually magic, and you don't get this completely for free. Just like when we talk about costs or security or compliance and resilience, AWS gives you incredibly powerful tools and concepts, but you need to use those tools and you need to embrace those concepts and integrate them into your ecosystem and your ways of working. And we work hard to do that. We run our US businesses in two regions in East and West, multiple AZs in each. Our most critical workloads are active-active with latency-based routing. We do auto scale, although honestly we tend to run a bit over provision partly because we want to be able to fail our entire business, all divisions over into one of those regions within minutes, which we do occasionally. And this particular topology does not make sense for everyone, but whatever does make sense, focus on standardizing the deployment pattern that you want your teams to have. We have spent a lot of time organizing and defining our non-negotiable requirements. We've organized them into a couple of different tiers, this platinum uh, this multi-region, multi-AZ, active-active uh, version we call our platinum standard, and we really hold ourselves accountable to that. We've also made a bet on a company-wide deployment pipeline that lets us do blue-green deployments across regions consistently and safely. That's a big investment, but we have found that it is worth it. AWS also talks a lot about powerful architectural concepts. Uh, you heard about a few of them a minute ago. Uh, we're also big fans of static stability, thinking about how your system behaves in isolation so that when everything around it is going haywire, you don't actually need to take any action to remain stable. I think that's important when you think about how much complexity there is in many of these cloud architectures. Loose coupling is great. It's how we build evolutionary architecture, but with microservices everywhere and event-driven everything, these things can be hard to reason about. And I think when we look at production incidents, much more than straight failures, what we see are complicated, degraded performance, partial, rely, partial failures, uh, you know, across multiple systems interacting in some kind of complex way. And I think, by the way, that's true in incidents within the clouds as well, those, those do happen. You also need the tools. Uh, so I mentioned our deployment pipeline, but everything starts with how you affect change in the environment that has to be managed, and that means with infrastructure as code, not with the AWS console. Uh, that's absolutely critical. We've also invested in tooling that helps us reason about the state of our infrastructure in sort of larger logical units. We built kind of a data layer and a management plane that helps us do things like coordinate those large scale failures still with appropriate access control. I'll make just a quick plug for Cloud Doctor, which you can see in our booth. We're also really excited about all the investments we see coming from AWS. A few were just mentioned. Fault Injection Simulator is, is a favorite of ours. Um, yeah, lots of amazing tooling continue to be invested in by AWS. We also know that no matter how good the tools are, things are gonna fail. And so we practice for that. Yes, doing exercises with tech teams is key, but also think about it cross department. How do you engage customer comms, call center, uh, decision makers that you may need if you're gonna disable a capability in the heat of the moment? We think company-wide, uh, organization-wide game days can be really powerful for that. I, uh, I'll just admit I couldn't resist an opportunity to mention our former president, but he sort of said something about software engineering. Resilience comes from learning and adaptation. 
Sometimes that learning is in the heat of the moment, right? How do you coordinate across multiple teams to debug and fix these complicated system interactions that we're talking about? Collaborative problem solving really is the new normal. We can't just all look at our own APIs and contracts and say, you know, hey, it's not me. Uh, so think about how you incentivize that. Sometimes the learning is in the follow-ups. At Capital One, we talk a lot about blameless postmortems, and we spend the time really digging deep when things fail. We aren't trying to assign blame, but we are trying to find the truth, and it really matters a lot. And so invest in that, and in particular, invest in tracking the follow-ups. I know AWS talked about that a moment ago. That part is important. I think at the end of the day, we have found that we spend a lot of time working on the systems that help us learn and improve. And to a large extent, the time we spend looking backward is the way we speed up moving forward. I wanna make a quick side point on serverless. I think we at Capital One have made a pretty intentional investment in adopting more and more managed services. And I think it's interesting to talk about that in the context of resilience. Over the years, I think we have all embraced distributed DevOps, we have shifted left, and you know we might have horizontal SRE teams or platform teams, but generally, all of our application teams have a lot of ownership of their infrastructure, and that has a bunch of benefits that I think we all understand. It also makes some pretty big asks of those teams. Be cost efficient, be resilient, patch your vulnerabilities. Uh, it's not quite the simplicity that the cloud promised. I think we also see the need to build internal platforms and abstraction layers that then help those teams uh, to do all of those things. And this is where we think serverless fits in. We wanna move teams up the stack. We wanna lean into the shared responsibility model and basically get AWS to do as much work as possible on our own resilience. There is some potential risk with that, operationally, sure, but I think we see the resilience of the managed services to be good and improving. People also talk about lock-in, but I think we've already seen containers kind of surpass raw VMs. We see functional event-driven models pretty much everywhere. I think in most domains, we are building lighter weight applications, and we're even starting to talk about being able to run them on-prem or at the edge or anywhere in between. And so we think this move up the stack really is on the right side of history, and we wanna continue to offload undifferentiated heavy lifting, not only to improve our productivity, but to improve our resilience over time as well. Parting thoughts, yes, do the textbook stuff. Start with the well-architected framework, but make it your own. Be intentional about setting standards and expectations for architectural resilience with your teams. Educate your teams, track your progress. Integrate those standards into your tools. Start all the way at the beginning of the development process. Build the guardrails that enforce resilience requirements right into the infrastructure. Interrogate all those dependencies and use architectural tools like static stability to mitigate them. And then most important, think about how you cultivate the mechanisms, to use the AWS word, for learning and response, both during emergencies, which you should be practicing for, and in the follow-ups that help you improve over time. I think like a lot of things in tech, resilience isn't just about tech, it is also about you as a responsive and resilient organization as well. Thanks for your time. I'll hand you back to Sean. Thank you, Will. Some really great learning out there that people can start applying to their workloads and implementing immediately. I especially love the little bit on serverless at the end. I gave a, a shout out to it earlier. It is such a good way to start to reduce your operational burden and put it in someone else, i.e. our hands to some extent. A uh, founding member of the Amazon EC2 team put it really nicely. You can't legislate against failure. Focus on fast detection and response. We all know there are gonna be failures. So this is where observability, gives you the ability to efficiently detect, investigate, and respond. Often customers don't detect issues as soon as they begin. There's a lag from when the issue starts to when you find it. You can respond to failures quicker if you alert near the source. Investigation is where people spend the most amount of time during an operational event. This is the largest contributor to downtime. I mentioned that incident earlier, seven hours to investigate. Leverage logs, metrics, tracing to help you Investigate quickly and understand the root cause. Your time is valuable. Focus on the stuff that matters during an operational event. There's nothing worse than trying to fix something and making the situation worse. And I mentioned our COE process earlier. Make sure you conduct a post-event analysis to help you determine how you could have prevented this. It will probably happen again if you don't. 
Your goal be, should be to ensure that doesn't happen. You never have repetition in these errors. And if it does, you know how to identify it faster and remediate it automatically. Our philosophy of monitoring is to ensure we measure the things customers care about and measure them from multiple perspectives. We wanna continuously introspect those metrics and question them. This is all to understand the customer experience. Instrumentation allows us to learn about our system, give operators real-time feedback on how the system is operating, and feed data into alarms. This helps us detect and respond to events when they happen. We need to make sure we're monitoring the right things and asking the right questions. We want to ask these questions all about our systems. Why is it operating that way? You need to add instrumentation, go right to the top of the stack, and figure out what's going on. The instrumentation produces logs, metrics, and traces. We use alarms and dashboards to analyze those, and then we ask more questions. Why did that thing go into alarm? What was actually going on when I saw this spike in the dashboard? And to answer that, we need more instrumentation. And we go through the same circle over and over again, and it improves operations, and more importantly, it improves our end customer experience. This is the virtuous cycle of monitoring. Think about a real world example, a service that customers are calling through a load balancer. So you get a call, trying to get some product info, it goes and hits the load balancer. Questions you wanna ask, what product are we looking up? Who called the API? What was this end customer? What type of, was it coming through a website, coming through some other area? Did we find the item in our local cache? Or did we have to punch out and get to a remote cache? How long did it take to read from the cache? How full is the local cache? How long did the query take? You went out to a remote database perhaps, did the query succeed? And how long did it take to go back and populate the caches? Was the cache full? Did you have to evict items? And how big was that product info object that you went and fetched? And what was the response code from the server? And finally, what was the latency? If I was operating this service in production, I would need so much instrumentation in this code to be able to understand its behavior in production. That's a good thing. I need the ability to troubleshoot failed requests, slow requests. I want to monitor for trends, signs that different de dependencies are underscaled or misbehaving. There's a lot there. Don't oversimplify. And we have a couple types of metrics we categorize. First, health metrics. Am I failing? It doesn't answer the question, why am I failing? Health metrics, the alarms are there to alert you to issues. And then the diagnostic metrics. What's the value of this thing I measured? Why isn't my system working? These both fall into three essential categories. The customer experience metrics are the ones that let you detect that your customer is a problem and the service is not responding to them. Once you've found a problem, you can use impact assessment metrics to measure the number and percentage of customers, resources, workloads impacted, and then you can use operational health metrics to determine why the impact is occurring, what, when the why is discovered, responders and automation can take action to go and resolve the event. There are three commonly er agreed upon pillars of observability. It's metrics, log, and traits. Metrics are the numeric data measured at various time intervals, request rates, error rates, duration, CPU percentage. Logs are your timestamp records of distributed events that occurred within an application or a system, such as a failure, an error, or just a state transformation. And traces represent a single user's journey across multiple applications and systems, usually with microservices, great, modern architecture, we have a broad suite of observability capabilities. We have native services that integrate deeply with our AWS services. We have container insights and Lambda insights. You heard about some new ones being launched this morning from Adam. We have, um, you have, you have uh, open source tools, manage Grafana, manage Prometheus, big fan. We give you lots of options, lots of choices, so you can pick the right tool for your workload. With that, I am super excited to introduce Kim Weiland, Vice President of Enterprise Operations at FINRA, who's gonna talk more about the importance of observability. Please welcome Kim. Good afternoon. FINRA, FINRA is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And we, we help play a critical role in ensuring the integrity of America's financial system. We write and enforce rules governing the ethical activity of brokers in the United States. We examine firms for compliance for those rules. We foster market transparency, and we educate investors. 
In addition, we also do big data, lots of big data. FINRA has processed peak volumes of over 600 billion market events per day. We do this in support of 24 exchanges, and we have had to run upwards of 300,000 compute nodes in a single day. Currently, we have a storage footprint of about 500 petabytes. We did not get here overnight. We started in early 2014, 2015, and by 2016, we were doing about 39 billion transactions. We had about 100 RDS instances. That grew by 2019, where we were doing about 190 billion transactions. And we upped into about 500 databases at that point, with about a 50 petabyte uh, storage footprint. But between 2019 and 2022, there was unprecedented market volatility. And we have grown to an average data intake of over 450 billion events per day. Over our 500 petabyte storage footprint, and we have over 1,200 databases. For 2026, what does the production look like? Simply bigger. So the question is, is how did we get here? We got here by starting with some very fundamental architectural principles. We are a data-centric organization, and therefore it started with our data management. And this is more than just storage. It includes data registration, data lineage, data lifecycle, including security data classifications. We wanted to ensure that we took advantage of cloud elasticity. Everything from serverless to flexibility with instance types, flexibility with storage types, and again, making sure that it was done in such a way that we could do on-demand scalability. From an architecture perspective, you have to start with a core framework of services. All of our application teams understand the supported blueprints. There's centralized messaging. We are API focused and we prefer open source. But security is also a key part of that architectural principle. And it's not just encryption configuration, authorizations, and observability in terms of it being auditable. DevOps infrastructure is code that is core, including your CI, CD, and all of the automated testing that needs to happen in that area. Operations needs to be resilient and, again, automated. It also needs to be performant, and you have to have that enterprise observability in order to ensure all of those are balanced. The output of all of that data should be done in such a way that compliance is also done as code, and you can do analytics in order to show it. To manage this is a balancing act. It's a balancing act between innovation, optimization, and adoption. Innovation. <laughs> AWS has new services all the time. In order to do that, you have to have service evaluations on how you integrate those services into your architecture, into your observability. You can do that through R&D, through POC. We also are very active in preview participation, and it allows us to give informed feedback to those services. For optimization of workloads, it is observability of capacity, but also those cost efficiencies in order to get the most efficient, cost-effective workloads. And then adoption, delivery-focused automation. Putting that automation in the hands of the teams with the provisioning guardrails so that they can do the right thing the easiest way. But that automation has to be handled at scale. <clears throat> so again, observability, monitoring. Everyone is familiar with monitoring. That's what they think of with observability. But it is far more than that. It is compliance, everything down to records management oversight, policy enforcement. It is security. Yes, it is audible, but it's also, do you have those standards in your architectural principles for security logging, for security control? Operational scorecards. These are not just testing, but what is your resilience posture of your cloud environment? Can you measure it? Can you view it? Everything including AWS Trusted Advisor, Great for cost optimization. And then application health status, the highest layer. <clears throat> and 
This is important not only for those core connectivities is your application up, but also what are the dependencies of those applications, either direct dependencies or indirect dependencies. About three years ago, we embarked on a strategic vision to do the multi-region disaster recovery. And we did so basing it on some core services, Amazon S3 with the cross-region replication for data, Aurora Global Database, KMS multi-region keys, and the Dy Dynamo Global Tables specifically around Parameter Store. Combining those, again, to make a specific strategic vision for what that architecture would look like. And it continues to grow. We continue to infuse resilience through those architecture and services. You always want to constantly learn and evaluate opportunities for efficiencies between those regions. While, of course, ensuring data encryption, data security, and your data durability. So observability, specifically for resilience, we have annual tests, sometimes more than that, of the multi-region. So we created what we call FINRA Canary, which of course reports into our birdcage, in order to check the health of the systems in the multiple regions, but not just the system itself or its core dependencies, but also its downstream dependencies. So it cares about itself and it cares about its friends. To do this, we've implemented a simple red light, yellow light, green light <laughs> implementation. And you can look at them across regions and go, my app is good, my app is good, but my friends aren't so happy. And that may be expected. Not every app's position in disaster recovery may be up at any given time. But knowing where that is and when both you become your app happy and your friends and all your neighbors that you depend on, that's when you go green. And that allows a level of observability to be able to be seen across the enterprise and at scale and across regions. There we go. So I will leave you with some parting thoughts about managing this at scale. Again, integrated security, hands-off operations. Infrastructure is code. You are not gonna go on a server and fix something <laughs> because that server may not be there tomorrow. It may be a different server. So make sure it is a hands-off operation. Automation, automation of onboarding to your fleet and make sure that it is self-reporting and the audit trails are there. But most importantly, it is delivery focused, self-service automation that those teams can use to make the right thing the easy thing. With that, I will pass the stage back to Sean. Thank you, Kim. You know, as you heard Kim talk about the main, uh, importance of maintaining observability, resilience is not a one and done thing or a checklist project. You must continuously invest in improving your resilience, which is what we're gonna close with today. By the way, I have to give her a shout out for calling dependencies your friends. Um, they're your friends until they break, and then you're quite angry at those dependencies, but it's, it's nice when they can be your friends. Um, part of continuous improvement is making sure that every workload is reviewed using the AWS wall architecture framework. Not just once, but every time you make a significant change to your workload. The well architected framework is a set of questions, design principles that enables you to build and deploy faster, to release value more often, understand where you have risks in your architecture. You want to intentionally know about those risks and ensure that your architectural decisions that highlight, how, ensure that you've made intentional architectural decisions that highlight how they will impact business outcomes. And you want to make sure your teams know all about the best practices we've learned from reviewing thousands of customers' architectures on AWS. The reliability pillar of Well Architected outlines some key design principles. Automatically recovering from failure. Think back to Will's examples at Capital One. You want to test recovery procedures. We talked about this earlier, the importance of chaos engineering and continuous testing. You want to be able to scale horizontally to increase workload availability and plan for your capacity needs. Right size your instances and resources to match your workloads needs. You heard Will talk a little about being over provisioned. Getting close to right 
will also, as the bonus, help you optimize your costs, something we all care about, and manage change and automation. Performing, uh, performing operations is, operational excellence principles are something that are also really important. It's the second pillar in Walk Detected. The first one to think about is performing operations as code. You can define your entire workload, applications, infrastructure as code, and update it with code. That's a game changer if you get to that level of automation. You can design workloads to allow components to be updated regularly to increase the flow of beneficial changes into your workloads. And as you use your operations procedures, look for opportunities to improve them. Use proactive threat modeling to identify potential sources of failure so they can be removed or mitigated ahead of time. And finally, drive improvement through lesson learned from all operational events. That correction error of error process I keep coming through back to. It's something that people forget about. They get worried about blame. Do not think about blame. Think about the learning. One of our favorite mechanisms for doing this is game days. After you design for resilience in place, you want to make sure that it works in production. And a game day is a way to ensure that everything works as planned. Use game days to regularly exercise your procedures for responding to events and failures as close to production as possible. This includes in production when possible. And you want to use the people who will be actually involved in failure scenarios. It's a very common mistake to have a paper exercise, and none of the folks who are actually on call at 3 a.m. are involved. Game days should simulate a failure or an event to test systems, processes, and team responses. The purpose is to perform the actions the team would perform as if that event happened. And you have to do this regularly. You want muscle memory on how to respond. You don't want someone reading the manual. I'm going to say it again at 3 a.m. at night. It's always 3 a.m. somewhere, that's for sure. Um, and avoid that. Infrastructure event management. This is something we offer to our large enterprise support customers. It's available to you if you're an enterprise support customer. It's focused on fo planning and support for business critical events. Think about steps you might take to prepare your workload to handle a 10x traffic increase due to a product launch. Like our latest Kindle, I went and ordered one. I'm sort of excited about writing on a Kindle. Um, customer onboarding, it could be tied to an ad campaign. Anything that's going to happen that's going to cause a large change in how you operate. Our enterprise support team can work with you on a t over a timeline of several weeks to figure out how your infrastructure is configured, make sure service, service limits are right, make sure auto scaling groups are in place, look at your load balancers. They'll also raise awareness inside AWS about your event and prepare support engineers to be ready to tackle any issues that come up. We use this for events like Prime Day internally. We can do it with you as well. And for those really exceptional cases, I'm thinking back to Cyber Monday this week for those retailers out there. We offer joint mission control. This is just like NASA, right? Going back to where we started. Think about an all hands on deck event to make sure the right people potentially in the room with you. During Prime Day, we have hundreds of engineers who come together both virtually and in person to prepare for the worst case scenario while being ready and hoping for the best. Finally, I want to give you a couple resources. These are things you can reach out to get more information. Three really good things here. First, the well-architected framework. We have a set of pages that is full of information. Everyone should have checked out the well-architected framework if you're running in AWS. Second, a brand new white paper published by one of our principal essays, Mike Hagen, on fault isolation boundaries. Really compelling. I saw Corey Quinn tweeting about it the day it came out. I was on vacation. Got me excited that it got published. Really good information there. And finally, our AWS solutions library, which is full of solutions for all purposes. In this case, we've just launched the resilience guidance. Uh, we have backup and restore, failover and failback, and many more. Please check out the solutions library. All that being said, because resilience is continuous, you have to think about it as a journey instead of a destination. You are never quite done. We realize that all of you, our customers, are in different spots in that resilience journey. Some of you are just starting out. Some of you are further along. We heard from Will, we heard from Kim. They're pretty far along on that journey. But we have one thing all of us have in common. We're all builders on this journey. Whether you're an executive building a business strategy around resilience or a developer building resilience in an application or part of a cloud CLE or DevOps team building guardrails out, AWS can provide you with the right guidance, the services, and infrastructure to enable our success. I want to thank all of you for spending this hour with us. Uh, for me and Francesca, and please have a great reInvent.